And we'll see today that the response of God's people is very practical. In this case, it has life and death consequences for people living everyday lives. So that's our theme for today, how God's people respond to him. Let me pray before we read Isaiah. Lord Father, your word, the depths of it, the unsearchable depths of it. Here we are, a passage which I've heard from people through the week has been difficult to understand and there has been much discussion. We pray, Lord, that as we look at it now, you would be with us. I pray, Lord, that my words would be true to it. I pray, Lord, that we would all grow in our understanding, that we would know you better and that we would respond to what we know of you. So be with us, Lord, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're reading from the beginning of chapter 7. You'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to read all of chapter 7 and 8, um, but we'll begin chapter 7. This took place during the reign of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Aram's king, Rezin, and Israel's king, Pekah, son of Remaliah, went to fight against Jerusalem but they were not able to conquer it. When it became known to the house of David that Aram had occupied Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son Shear Jashub to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smouldering sticks, the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. For Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah, has plotted harm against you. They say, let's go up against Judah, terrorise it and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tobiel's son as king in it. This is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. It will not occur. The chief city of Aram is Damascus. The chief of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim too will be shattered, will be, will be too shattered to be a people. The chief city of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive. Have a son and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. For the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good. The land of the two kings fall before the Lord. The boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good. The land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you and your people and your father's house such a time as it as has never been seen since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. And then turning to 8, chapter 9. eight verse 9, sorry. Chapter 8, verse 9. Of Isaiah, thank you. Band together, peoples, and be broken. Pay attention, all you distant lands. Prepare for war and be broken. Prepare for war and be broken. Devise a plan, it will fail. Make a prediction, it will not happen. For God is with us. For this is what the Lord said to me with a great power to keep me from going the way of this people. Do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. 
Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. He will be a sanctuary. But for the two houses of Israel, he will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony. Seal up the instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. Here I am with the children the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of armies who dwells on Mount Zion. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the spiritists who chirp and mutter, shouldn't the people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Go to God's instruction and testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there will be no dawn for them. They will wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged and look upward, will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness and the gloom of affliction. And they will be driven into thick darkness. You'll need to keep chapter 8 open in particular. Um, I'll come back, certainly be coming back to that later, and you'll need that chapter in particular. A quick review of where we're up to in Isaiah. Two weeks ago, we were in the first five chapters of chapters. They con contained a withering diagnosis of God's people, didn't they, of Judah. Verse 4 of chapter 1 made it quite clear how God's people in Judah were treating God and how they were living. O oh, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on him. Judah is doing a terrible job of representing God. A terrible job. As a result, Isaiah has prophesied that judgment will come, but that through that judgment, God will bring salvation for some. Later in that chapter, verses 25 and 26, God told Judah, I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove all your impurities. I will restore your judges to what they once were and your advisers to their former state. Afterward, you will be called the righteous city, a faithful city. Quite a contrast, isn't it? Israel should have drawn the nations to Jerusalem to worship God, but they aren't. So is God's plan blocked? No. No. We read in chapter 2 of Isaiah that God will complete his plan to draw the nations to himself, that he will have a people taught to walk in his ways. Then last week, Andrew helped us look at the account of Isaiah's vision of the Holy Lord God seated on a heavenly throne. Now, Isaiah is thought to have had that vision before he began his ministry. But... I'll explain later why I think it is where it is. Do you remember Isaiah's response to meeting God? He was undone. His very being was shattered to its core. Andrew asked us a question. How do we respond when we meet the Holy God? Someone asked me after the service, what's it matter? What's it matter for here and now? I hope that after today you know why it matters and you are convinced that it matters very much. 
So to our passage for today. Today we meet Ahaz, the king of Judah, a king in his David's direct descent, and he's meant to be like David, after God's own heart. He's meant to be uh, God's vice regent, God's representative over God's people on earth. And Isaiah is instructed by God to go and meet Ahaz at the conduit that brings water into the city. Ahaz has heard that Pekah um, is the king of the northern tribes, the ten tribes of Israel. He's let the army of Syria come and camp in the territory, Israeli territory, not far from Jerusalem. So Ahaz has got two armies camped just over the border, ready to invade. Now these two nations have made an alliance because they think the regional superpower at the time is a bit weak. There's a bit of a kerfuffle going on in the leadership in Assyria. It might be a chance when they can break away. And they think that if they can manage to get the resources of Judah under their control, that'll increase their chances of successfully breaking away. Now, Ahaz has a very practical decision to make, doesn't he? It's a very difficult one. He's got a choice. He can go with the revolt or he can go with Assyria and their protection. It's not easy because Assyria might be powerful, but they're terrible overlords. They're just not, well, they govern viciously. But Ahaz decides that making an enemy of Assyria is the worst choice. So he decides not to join the revolt. He chooses Assyria. That's why the armies are gathered on his northern border. And Ahaz and the people are trembling like the trees of the forest, shaking in the wind at the prospect of these two armies invading. And that's why Ahaz is out checking the water supply. He's been very wise, isn't he? If you're going to face a siege, you're going to need lots of water. And Isaiah comes to Ahaz at the water conduit with a third option. Instead of choosing beneath, uh, between the alliance of your neighbours and Assyria, choose God. In verse 4 it says, that's of chapter 7, Calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smouldering stubs of firebrands, the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Ahaz, keep calm. Do nothing. Don't be afraid. God will save you. So Isaiah's advice is from the Lord, don't be afraid of this alliance of your neighbours. Instead, fear me. Trust me. God will protect you if you only trust in me. How would we go? We've got a situation where our life, our physical existence is in danger. And God says, trust me. Don't worry about the two armies. Trust me. Don't choose an earthly side. Trust me. It's not what the world would call practical advice, is it? Yet God tells Ahaz that if he does not stand firm in his faith, he will fall. Now, I said a moment ago, Ahaz was doing the wise thing, checking the water supply. It's wise if you think about what Ahaz fears. But God has sent Isaiah with a different message, hasn't he? Reading from verse 7. This is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. It will not occur. The head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. 
If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. So here Isaiah is calling Syria Aram and he's calling Israel Ephraim. It just confuses things, but that's what he's doing. Ahaz should be comforted. God has told him these two kings, these two kings will not conquer Judah. It will not happen. These two kingdoms are going to be destroyed very soon. But Ahaz has made his choice. He's chosen the devil he knows. And his choice follows the same pattern that Judah's been making. They haven't chosen God. The problem for Ahaz is that when Assyria come and lay waste to Syria and Israel, they will keep coming. And in judging Judah and Ahaz, God will use Assyria to shave Judah within a millimetre of its life. Let me tell you a story that's mostly true. It might help you understand what Judah and Ahaz are doing. Um, a number of years ago now, someone very dear to both Lynn and I was travelling overseas. Toward the end of a trip, she started to feel a bit tired. And then just before she came home, she developed some bruising. She got back to Australia and went to see a doctor. The doctor didn't let her go home. Straight to hospital. Straight to Brisbane. She immediately had chemotherapy for myeloid leukaemia. Her sickness was diagnosed and needed immediate, drastic treatment. Ayaz and Judah are in a similar position. The first five chapters of Isaiah list a host of problems in Judah. Sin, iniquity, the way they treat people. Problems that are going to lead to the judgment of a holy God. Now our loved one would have been pretty unwise to say to the doctor, I'm not worried about the leukaemia. Just give me some anti, strong anti-inflammatories for the bruising and a pick-me-up of some sort so I don't feel tired. That's my problem. That'll fix me. No. She needed to go to hospital immediately. Ahaz and Judah can only see the armies gathered on their border. They don't see their real problem, do they? Sin and iniquity and a turning away from God. It's not the armies that should have them shaking. They should be shaking at the prospect of facing the judgment of a holy God. Now, I think that's why we've got chapter 6 where we have. Two pictures. Isaiah in the temple meets a holy God and his reaction. Second picture, Ahaz, out checking the water supply, relying on his own wisdom. Ahaz, um, Isaiah takes the word of God to him, doesn't he? Ahaz continues to rely on his own wisdom, shakes at the presence of two armies just over the border. Who's more right to be afraid? Checking the water supply is not going to divert God's wrath. Checking the water supply is not going to reduce Judah's sinfulness. Ahaz is worrying about the symptoms, not the severe disease that lies behind it. God will deal with the armies Ahaz is afraid of and use the very nation Ahaz thinks is on his side to bring judgment on Ahaz and Judah. Ahaz is so far from trusting God that even when God offers to give him any sign he wants, from the depths of Sheol to the heights of heaven, any sign, Ahaz refuses the offer. He doesn't want a sign. He would rather trust his own plans than believe that God will do what he says he will do. But God gives a sign regardless, doesn't it? Doesn't he? It's the sign of a virgin birth, 
of a boy named Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is unlikely to be referring to a virgin birth in Isaiah's time. But the sign given tells Ahaz that Syria and Israel will both be invaded and destroyed within the next few years. A child conceived on the day Isaiah is talking with Ahaz won't be old enough to tell right from wrong and Syria and Israel will already be desolate. We see later in chapter 8, verse 8, that when Assyria come, they'll sweep right through Syria, Israel, Judah, right up to the walls of Jerusalem. God will judge them. But Judah will not be totally destroyed by the Assyrians. Jerusalem and its people are saved. The head remains. It's right up to the neck. It is Emmanuel, God with us, who saves this fragment of people from the Assyrians. And we're told the presence of Emmanuel frustrates and breaks the plans and predictions of armies and of nations. God is with Judah against the alliance. Judah need, need not fear them. But God is with Assyria He's using Assyria to come and invade Judah and to judge them and put Jerusalem under siege. Yet God delivers the head. Signs in the Bible can work two ways. They may be a symbol that God will fulfil his promises or a symbol that God has fulfilled his promises. They can point forward or back. In the reading we had from Matthew's Gospel of the birth of Jesus, Matthew uses this passage in Isaiah to confirm that God's promise of a saviour for his people has been fulfilled. The true Emmanuel, the one foretold, God with us, he has come, he has become human. the true deliverer of God's people has been born. From Isaiah chapter 8 onwards, and you will need your Bibles here, there are two groups of people who are described and compared. Ahaz and Isaiah are symbolic of these two groups. And these two groups are separated by their response to Emmanuel, to God with us, by their response to the rock that is Emmanuel. So if we look at their responses, on one side we have people who call many things a conspiracy. On the other side are people who do not call those things a conspiracy. On one side, we have a people of fear. On the other side, we have a people who are not terrified. But they do fear the Lord of armies because he is holy. Notice they fear him because he's holy. They are in awe of him. On one side, we have two houses of Israel, Ephraim, Judah. They stumble over the rock that is Emmanuel. They are trapped by his coming. On the other side, we have those who take sanctuary in the rock that is Emmanuel. On one side, we have a people that go to inquire of spiritists and mediums to try and discover their future. They are a people in the dark. They have no light. They wander in their darkness. On the other side, we have a people of the word. Remember John 1? people of the light even, a people who inquire of God, a people who have bound up the testimony and the instruction of the Lord. They haven't bound it up so they can keep it for themselves. They've bound it up so they can keep it from being altered and ensure that it is passed down truly to faithful disciples who will pass it on to others. That's why it's bound up. On On one side we have a people for whom there will be no dawn, They will only see darkness, distress, affliction. 
and they will be driven into even greater darkness. On the other side, we have the people of the word who speak truthfully according to that word. And you see this division of people? That is clear and stark and dramatic. It isn't just Ahaz and Isaiah, Judah and Isaiah's disciples, is it? And John's Gospel, as I've already alluded to, picks up some of these images. The light, the darkness. The same division is there that we see in Isaiah. John lets us know that Jesus came to those who were his own people and yet they did not receive him. So John describes Jesus' true family, those who did receive him. What is clear from Isaiah and from John, and John speaking about an entirely different generation of people, 700 odd years later, is that many who thought they were God's people were not. They had taken God's promises, they had taken God's commands, and they had bastardised it. They had removed them from their father. That allowed them to think they were God's people. They did not really fear God. They did not really trust him. And they lived like the world around them. Remember those two groups of people? They thought they were in the second group while really being in the first. I pray that all of us here today think we're safe in Jesus. But I suspect there are people here who aren't. I suspect there are people here who have not really grasped their sinfulness before a holy God. Who have not really grasped their need to be saved by a saviour. Who have not really grasped that unless they respond to Jesus with repentance and seeking forgiveness and faith and a heart driven to live in response to God with us, they are like people wandering in the darkness, spiritually dejected and hungry. They look towards the earth and they see only distress, darkness and affliction. When Jesus come again, which group will we be in? Are we like Judah or like Isaiah? Are we waiting just as Isaiah was waiting? Of course, God's people are waiting for something slightly different. Emmanuel's already come, hasn't he? And he's promised he will return. And that's what God's people wait for now. Isaiah did not see Jesus physically come there were generations and generations of people who did not see Jesus physically come. Yet when Jesus did come, some like Simeon were waiting, faithfully waiting. Isaiah waited patiently, trusting that God would do what he said he would do. It may appear that God is hidden, but God does not forget his promises or allow them to be blocked. God kept Isaiah from going the way of the people of Judah by speaking powerfully to him. The word of God has great power to sustain the people of God while they wait faithfully for his promises to be fulfilled. God's people have a role to play in God's plan. Isaiah and his children were to be signs and wonders in Israel. They would live in faith so that their lives were a testimony to God and his goodness. The way to do that is to live in obedience to God's word. 
but also to keep the word and pass it down to faithful disciples so that future generations might have it to sustain them while they wait and to sustain them in the darkness around them by their lives and their faithful teaching of God's word God's people offer hope to a world in darkness in so many ways And yet God's people are not to live in fear, not to see conspiracies all around. The holy God and our sin that offends him, that is our concern. We are to live in fear of his judgment and in awe of him. Now today we've clearly seen two groups of people. They're divided by their response to a holy God and his son Jesus. He is the rock, the divider, if you like. We are either saved by him or judged by him. We are either shelter in him or he is a trap and a snare, cause us to fall and break. But he's a rock that will not be removed, a rock that will not be ignored. What sort of rock is Jesus for you? Do you celebrate Christmas with unbounded thankfulness for the rock of shelter that is Emmanuel, God with us? Do you celebrate his coming every day? I pray it is so. Let me pray again. Lord Father, we thank you for this picture here. It's stark, it's dramatic. And it's fearsome. Lord, help us to seek you as our shelter. Father, please come to us by your Holy Spirit and change us to be your faithful people who carry your word and light to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.